you this morning, humbly asking that your Holy Spirit will work in our hearts. We pray that you will cause us to be sensitive to your voice, and we pray that you will speak to us. Father God, glorify your name as we worship you in the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, why don't we play a game? Okay, um, it's a game called This or That. It's a nice game to do when you're on a road trip, or it's, sometimes it's called Would You Rather. Okay, now um, everybody can take part. So if you're seated with somebody, you have to, you know, you can do it with, uh, with a group or with, a, with, a, with somebody seated beside you. If you're seated with somebody you do not know, then, you know, take a chance, okay? <laughs> so this or that, uh, so here's the, uh, the way we play it is this. You choose one, or you have to make a choice between one or the other. The first one is this. Question number one for this or that. Can we flash the, 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 the slide? Okay, would you rather win a million pesos or have your best friend win 10 million pesos? Okay, why don't you ask the person beside you? Would you rather win a million pesos or let your best friend win the million pesos, okay? If you are seated next to your best friend. <laughs> huh? Best friend? Okay, question number two for this or that. Would you rather have sandpaper as toilet paper or hot sauce as eye drops? <laughs> what would you choose? Huh? Ew. <laughs> I mean, if you had to choose, which one will you choose? <laughs> Okay, third and last one, okay? Otherwise, tita mahoman. Third one. Would you rather find a million pesos or find true love? Now, if you're seated with your spouse, be very careful with your answer. Would you rather win a, find a million pesos or find true love? Find true love? <laughs> I mean, you can, you can always say, you know, I'd rather go for the million pesos because I have already found my true love. <laughs> okay, anyway, so each question gave you a choice, right? You had two options. And the game became a little bit difficult when you don't know which to choose because there are maybe two good options or two bad options, right? Of course, it's easier if the, the other one is a better option and the other one is a bad one, diba? Masayo na siya. Now, in our passage today, the one you would, that we just read, Jesus actually plays this game with us in verse 24. Let's look at verse 24 again. He says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Okay? As far as Jesus is concerned for the this or that game, you have two choices, serve God or money, right? Of course, if you're a Christian, you will say, of course I choose God. Why will I choose money, right? In his book, The Christian Atheist, Craig Rochelle coins this phrase from the title Christian Atheist, which kind, kind of like, uh, is like an oxymoron, right? Because they're contradictory, Christian, yeah. Atheist? How can that be? So here's how he defines a Christian atheist. He says, a Christian atheist is someone who believes in God, but lives as if he does not exist. 
Now, we know what an atheist, right? An atheist would deny the existence of God. But for, for Craig Rochelle, the Christian atheist does not deny the existence of God. But if you look at his life, if, if you look at the way he lives his life, he lives as if God does not exist. And he says, I'm a Christian, but he lives as if God does not exist. He says or believes in one thing, but does something entirely different. I remember the story of a, a very wealthy older gentleman who just got married to a, a very young lady. And of course, you know, his friends were telling him, you know, he, she just married you for your money. You're very old. And look at her. She's very, very young. Diba? And so he comes to his bride and says, you know, tell me, honey, tell me the truth. If I lost all my money, will you still love me? And so his wife comes to him and said, oh, honey, don't be silly. Of course I will still love you. And I'd miss you terribly. Ah, oh, that's a joke. <laughs> so she's saying one thing, I love you, but I'll miss you terribly. That means she won't be around, okay? So she's saying something, but she meant something else. Now, when it comes to money, when it comes to our possessions, when it comes to our stuff, you and I can be a Christian atheist. Now, if you look at the back of the dollar bill, it actually says what? In God we trust, right? Now, the Christian atheist says it differently. He says, I believe in God, but I trust in money. Very few people would admit this. But if we look at the life that we live, we see that we are in many, many ways Christian atheists. We claim that we, we believe in God and yet we trust, we worship, we serve, and we believe in money. And Jesus, in this passage, connects money with our treasure, right? Verse 19, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, and if you have noticed, the word treasure is repeated three times here. And that word means anything that we store up as precious to ourselves. A treasure is anything that is precious to us. Now, question, what is precious to you? Your family? Your money? Your friendships? Is it your car? Your business? So the challenge that Jesus gives to us here is this. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. Notice he did not say it the other way around. He didn't say, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. We're saying that if I, my heart is somewhere here, my treasure will follow. It's not that way. He says, if your treasure, your money, you know, if that's what your treasure is, your heart is there already. So the question is, do we live out our faith in God when it comes to our treasures? Now let's look at two lessons from the text that we just read. As Jesus teaches us something about our treasures. Now the first one comes in the form of a warning. In verse 19, he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on heaven, on, on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. What is Jesus telling us here? He's telling us simply don't trust in money, right? Don't store up treasures here on earth. Don't trust money because over time, moth and rust, rust will destroy it. Or, you know, somebody can steal it. So don't waste your efforts on money. It's unreliable. Everybody agrees, right? Amen. Now, why would Christ tell us that? We know that, right? Why? Because we rely on money. We trust money. Now, I'm not saying that we should not have retirement plans or we should not have possessions or we should not save at all or maybe we should all live as monks, right? No, I'm not saying that. In fact, 1 Timothy 6:17 says, God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. But what happens is this. For a lot of us, 
We trust in money to provide us happiness. You don't agree? You say, of course, that's not true. <laughs> How many of you will say here that money can buy happiness? No one? How many of you here will say that, you know what? If I had a little bit more, it will actually help. <laughs> of course, diba? Right? We're just like the guy who says, you know, can it, it's, it's, they say it's better to be poor and happy than rich and miserable. But couldn't we work out something like, you know, moderately wealthy and a little bit moody, <laughs> right? We say we don't rely on money to bring us joy. But you know what? When we don't have it, we're miserable. Notice your, your countenance when it's tingbitay. But tingbits naman good. Because why? We believe in God, but we trust money to make us happy. Amen? I remember the story of a, of a man who was in a very, very serious accident. I think some of you have heard this story already. And you know, the, you know, the, he, 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 the medical staff ran to him and he was on the road. He was crying in pain and he's saying, oh, my BMW, my, my BMW. And so the medical technician asked him, sir, sir, okay, Lanka, sir, are you okay? And he says, my car. My car, how is my BMW? And, and the medical technician says, Sir, it's totally damaged. But you know, you shouldn't be concerned with that at, at this time. I mean, you know, you've been in an accident. Your arm, your other arm is lying on the other side of the road. And the man, you know, strains to look at the other side to look for his arm. And he said, oh no, my Rolex. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll say, I'm not like that. <laughs> right? But we believe that money can bring us happiness. That's why a lot of people are so much deep in debt today. Because their master is, and probably master card. <laughs> I know there are exceptions, right? I mean, some people have, 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 you know, fallen into really, really deep problems. Maybe there was a, you know, medical problem. Somebody got really sick. Of course, we can understand that. Or maybe you, your spouse mismanaged all the money. There are exceptions, of course, right? But the reason why a lot of people are in debt today is because we believe that this will buy us happiness. We, we get Something that we still do not have. You know, the house you could not afford. The car that you can't afford. The clothing, the gadgets, the vacation, right? Let's face it. We believe that this can bring us happiness. We believe in God, but our action says we trust in money. Amen? Why mo amen? Okay, ako rin mo amen. <laughs> okay, Second, secondly, we also trust that money can give us security. Right? You know, money has become our functional savior. What do I mean by that? For many people, their life goal is to have enough of this so that they will need or they do not have to worry. We, we want more of this so that we will be secure. Look at Matthew 6, 25, the next verse. Jesus then says, Therefore, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink about your body, what you will wear, is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes. So we say, God, I don't have money. God says, don't worry. I'll take care of it. But in our hearts, we are really saying, God, Give me enough of this so that I don't have to worry. Instead of, we're, instead of saying, God, give me enough of you so that I don't have to worry. Amen? What do we actually do? We are saying in our hearts, God, 
give me enough of this so that I will not have to worry. Instead of saying, God, give me enough of you so that I don't have to worry. And if we're honest, that's our life goal. We believe in God. We say that, but we trust in money. We trust in money to give to make us happy. We trust in money to give us security. Now, the second lesson that we see here is this. It reveals what is in our hearts. Because in verse 21, it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so the second lesson is simply this. Our ultimate treasure should be God himself, right? John MacArthur says, it sets it this way. He says, Jesus goes on to point out that a person's cherished possessions and his deepest motives and desires are inseparable. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. They will either both be earthly or both be heavenly. It is impossible to have one on earth and the one and the other in heaven. So Jesus is not saying that if we put our treasure in the right place, our heart will then be in the right place. Rather, the location of our treasure indicates where our heart already is. Amen? No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus did not say you cannot serve both God and what? Yourself. Or both God and power. Or, or both God and sex. Why money? Because money, we know money is the number one competitor of our hearts between God. Our, our devotion to God is that is what competes with God. It becomes an idol. It's a false God. It wants first place in our hearts. And we know we know that we should worship God. We know that we should serve God. We know that we should love God and use money. But what happens is this. We tend to serve and worship and love money and we use God. Right? God, give me this. Give me more of that. Give me more of this. I want to believe in you, but I want you to provide me with more of this. Now, I'm not saying, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we do not need money. That will be crazy, amen? We need money. But the question we have to ask is this. Do we trust God? Is God our treasure? Now, honestly, this is a hard, hard message to preach. Because it's preaching to my heart as well. Amen? I'm dealing with heart issues with money. And it is a heart issue. It is always a heart issue. So we need to evaluate and check ourselves. Now, this is, let me show you two illustrations from the New Testament. And let's see. Let's reflect and see how you and I can relate. The first one is the story of the rich young ruler. Thank you, Pastor Jasper, for sharing this last week. Remember that rich young ruler who comes to Jesus Christ and said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life, right? And what does, God, what does Jesus say? Mark 10, 21 to 22. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, um, One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have, give to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. Now, why does Jesus tell him to sell everything to follow him? Because he knows that in this man's heart, there is something more important to him than God. He was telling this man, choose. You want to follow me? Or you want to follow your money? It's a this or that game, isn't it? If you think about it, we make that choice every day. And look at what he did in verse 22. This is how he responded. Disheartened, verse 22, by the saying, or as at this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. 
why, why was he disheartened? Why did his face fall? Because he had a lot of money and they were more important to him than God. Now you will say, I will never do that. Really? Yes, you do. We all do. Every day of our lives, every day we choose the things of the world over the things of the kingdom of God. Most of us would spend more time watching TV, more time with our gadgets, more time with our Facebook, checking, you know, newspapers, instead of, you know, going to pray and spending time meditating on the scriptures. Hours and hours and hours in front of the TV, in front of the Facebook, in front of our gadgets, and just minutes or even seconds praying, <laughs> reading the scriptures. Amen? Be honest. So who's number one? As far as this guy is concerned, I'm sorry, Lord. I want to follow you, but I am not willing to give, to, to let go of my stuff. And to follow you with everything that I have. And many of us say that as well. I believe in God, but this is my treasure. Now, let's look at the second one, a second story, the story of Zacchaeus, right? We know the story. How many of you are familiar with Zacchaeus? The short guy, right? He was a tax collector. People did not like him. And he, as a tax collector, he had a license to steal. You know, he would steal from his fellow Jews. But one day, Jesus was around him. He wanted to meet Christ, right? So what did he do? Luke 19, verses 5 to 6. It says, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, remember, Zacchaeus climbed up a sycamore tree and Jesus was passing by. And so when he reached that point, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And you know what happened to the rest of the story? Zacchaeus met Jesus and everything changed. Look at what it says in verse 19. I'm sorry, chapter 19, verse 8. It says, Zacchaeus stood up. And said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. If I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. You know what happened? He's saying, he's really saying, Lord Jesus, I have met you. I have met you. And now all of a sudden, all of these other things are not as important to me anymore. I was all about the image. I was all about the money. I was all about the security. I was all about money giving me happiness. But Jesus, I see you now. And that stuff does not hold me anymore. Zacchaeus tells us that, you know, he's going to give his half to the poor. And those he cheated, he gives, he will give them four times. Look at what Jesus says, verse 9 to 10. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Now salvation did not come because he gave his money. He gave his money because salvation came to his home. Right? Now believe it or not, you know, I'm a pastor, but here's what I know. When I'm far from God, my heart you know, drifts away from Him. And when I'm far away from God, the world looks more appealing. The, work, the world looks better. And that's the way it is, isn't it? I guess it's not only me. Would you agree? When I'm close to Him, the things of this world do not look as appealing. Why? Why? Because I learn that he is enough. When I am close to God, I realize that all of these things don't mean anything if I'm close to him. Doesn't mean that I don't have to have money, but my money does not have me. If you find that you are still consumed with more 
and more and bigger and bigger and more of this and more of this, I would say this lovingly to you. It's probably because you're not walking real close with God today. If you find yourself that you are loving this world more than you do God, more than you do the Lord Jesus Christ, it's really because you don't know Him at all. Maybe you're just, you know, playing religion. Maybe you, you, you've drifted so far away from Him. That is why the world is so appealing. Because when we are far from Him, this looks really, really good. And when we don't have any, we're not happy. But when you're close to Him, it loses its power. Amen? So Jesus confronts us today with this. Where is your treasure? Is your treasure God or money? And I've said earlier, we make that choice every day. We make that choice every day. So let me just give you three quick applications. Three choices that you and I should make, you know, consciously be aware of when it comes to our worldly wealth. Number one, first is this, master your money. You have to rule over it. Don't let your money master you. Somebody once said this, money is a terrible master, but it's an excellent servant. Isn't that true? Money is a terrible master. But it's an excellent servant. <laughs> Mastering your money simply means you have to be a good steward of your stuff, of your money, of your possessions. Now, I don't know where you are today as far as your finances is concerned. I don't know where you are today as far as your stuff is concerned. Some of you might be in really, really deep debt. Or some of you might, might be so stressed out, your paycheck to paycheck. Or maybe some of you don't have any savings. Or maybe, you know, you might be in a poor financial condition or you made poor financial choices before and you're just reaping the consequences today. But I don't know. But depending on the situation, maybe for some of you, you need to have a budget. You need to understand where your money is coming from and where your money is going. Statistics say that most people don't actually have a budget. We only have it in our mind. this much there. And we don't even know where it's going. Amen? Now, you have this, right? Page 51 to 53, there's an exercise there to help you make a budget and make you understand where your money is coming from and where your money is going. Others of you, you might need to handle your debts. You're deep, deep, deep in debt. Now, page 56, 56 there's a method there, one, one of the methods only. But there's a debt, it's called the debt snowball method. Take a look at that if you are so much in debt, okay? For others of you, you might need to live below your means. <laughs> that means if you have this much amount of income, you must not spend more than your income. Amen? It also might mean that you might have to change your lifestyle. Diba? I mean, we all know that. We might need to practice self-control. Or perhaps you might really need to exercise some financial goals. Page 54. <laughs> Exercise on, you know, setting up financial goals. Whatever the case may be, whatever, wherever you are right now, as far as your situation is concerned. Maybe you have a lot of money. That's another story. But you're not giving enough. No? Whatever it is, you need, you and I need to master our Money. We need to be good stewards because God calls us to do that. Proverbs 27 verses 23 to 24 says this. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herd. Remember, this was an agricultural society. And says, for riches, 
do not endure forever, and the crown is not secure for all generations. Let me read to you how the message paraphrases this. It says, Know your sheep by name. Carefully attend to your flocks. Don't take them for granted. Possessions don't last forever, you know. Amen? We need to master our money. Now, just this coming week in the small groups, you're going to be watching, for those of you who are in the small groups, you're going to be watching a, a, uh, a video from Dave Ramsey's um, Financial Peace University. Okay? Um, uh, the topic is about saving money. So please, uh, for all those of you in the small groups, um, um, that's one of the things that you'll be watching this week. Now, for those of you who are not in the small group and you want to watch, uh, take a look at this little card that's, that was inserted in your handouts today. Choose from any of those schedules, and they will be watching the Financial Peace University uh, video of Dave Ramsey this week. Just choose from, and uh, you might even want to uh, contact um, the, uh, the, the, the small group leader and tell them, I'm joining you this week. Okay? Please uh, take advantage of that. It's free. Okay? Take advantage of it. And, and I, I tell you, it's a very, very good video. You're going to have your eyes open. For those of you who have never thought of saving money at all, it's a good watch. Okay? So that's the first one. That's the first application. Master your money. Second is this, practice generosity. Listen to these verses, Ephesians 4, 28. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that what? He may have something to share with those in need. So he's, not say, he's saying it's not just for food on the table, not just to provide for your family, but we work so that we can have something to share. Amen? And then, here's the reason why God blesses us financially. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 11. Listen to what Paul says. Now, you have to read the whole of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 here to get the context. But before this, Paul was telling um, the Corinthians that, you know, if you sow... You will, what you will sow, you will also reap. Look at what he says then. You will be made, if you, if you will sow or if you will plant a lot of seeds, you will get a lot of harvest. So in verse 11 he says, you will be made rich in every way so that, so that why? So that you can be stingy. Generous. So that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Paul tells us, when God prospers you, if you plant a lot of seeds, you will sow a harvest. And the reason why God will bless you is not so that you can what? Have a lot of cars, have a lot of houses. Why? So that you can be generous in every Occasion. In every occasion. Amen. Well, I'm okay. Amen. Okay. Now, I know genero generosity is something that we have to build up. It has to be a goal. Okay? I mean, that's the kind of ultimate financial freedom that we want to have, that we can be generous in every occasion. Some of you are probably thinking, now, I mean, you know, I can't be generous because I, I can barely meet our daily needs. And I understand that. But here's something I want you to consider. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Paul says, On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. ESV, more literal translation, it says, put aside and save as he may prosper. Now, what does 
this mean? He, did, he, does, he, he does not say that you have to set aside a certain amount, right? But he's saying here is that, you know, you give as the Lord blesses you. Do you know what statistics tell when it comes to, um, when it comes to giving? As far as, uh, this is, this is um, an American um, study. You know, the more you earn, diba? supposedly the more you earn, the more you give. But that's not the case. In the study that they made, studies that they have made, and I think it's true for us as well, is that the more a person earns, the less percentage he gives from his money. The more we earn, we should be more generous. But that's not the case for a lot of money. So if you want to think about generous giving, you must think about progressive giving. As, as God increases your harvest, you must progressively increase the percentage of your giving. Be generous. And you know what this tells us as well? It tells us that generosity does not happen by accident. You have to make it as a goal. You have to want to be generous. Because God has moved so much in your heart. Understand this. We become generous because we understand that God is a generous God. Amen. And it should simply flow out from our character because we know who our God is. And probably the reason why we don't want to be generous is because we might not, we do not understand fully the generosity of God in our lives. Amen. So if you cannot be generous today, it's all right. This is not a guilt trip, okay? Make it your goal to become generous someday. You might need to save up money. You'll learn a lot from the, from the video, by the way. You might need to start saving up money. You might need to take care of your debt first. And then someday, when that day comes, when God blesses you, be generous. Generosity is something that, that we learn. We have to make it as a goal. Okay, so master your money, practice generosity. Third, of course, is learn to be content. Here's what Paul says about contentment, Philippians 4, 11 to 12. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Of course, that's an entire sermon in itself, but twice here he says that he learned contentment, right? That means it is not natural. Contentment is not easy. It is not automatic. It involves effort. We need to learn to be content, right? So we need to make conscious effort, extra effort, because the world around us will scream to us, get your stuff, get more of this, get more of that, you know, get more of this money. And there's something about our fallen nature that wants us to have more of this stuff, right? We need to be conscious of the pull of the world. And I'm so glad that Paul wrote this. Because sometimes we have this idea that when we become Christians, we automatically become content, right? Well, we, say, we, we have this mistaken notion that we will always, you know, respond with peace and calmness when circumstances does not warrant it. Take the effort to be content. Learn to be content. Master your money. Practice generosity. Learn contentment. Let me end with a story from Stephen Cole. Stephen Cole says that legend has it that there was one time a very wealthy merchant uh, during the day of uh, the Apostle Paul. He had heard about the Apostle and had become so fascinated that he determined to visit Paul. So he, when he was passing, when this merchant was passing through Rome, he got in touch with Timothy and he arranged you know, a, meet, a meeting with, with uh, Paul, the prisoner. 
So when he stepped into his uh, cell, the merchant was surprised to find Paul looking, you know, he was old, he, knew he was frail, but he felt at once the strength and the peace and the magnetism of this man who relied on Christ as his all and in all. And they talked for some time, and finally the merchant left. Sorry, it ran out of battery. Okay, it says here, outside the cell, uh, he came and asked Timothy, what's the secret of this man's power? I've never seen anything like it before. And Timothy said, did you not guess? Paul is in love. And the merchant looked puzzled and says, in love? What do you mean? And Timothy said, yes, Paul is in love with Jesus Christ. And the merchant looked even more bewildered and he asked, is that all? And Timothy said, yes, that is everything. You know what? It all goes back to who really is our treasure. Amen? So here's the question. Where is your treasure today? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for the reminders that you give to us. And we thank you, Father, because... You remind us that you are the God who provides. You are the God who takes care of us. And I pray, Father, that as we have learned and listened to your word today, we will be challenged. That your Holy Spirit will continue to speak to us even when we leave this place. And as we handle our money, as we handle our finances, our worldly wealth, we pray, Father that we will honor you. We pray, Lord God, that we will give to you what you deserve. We pray, Father God, that we will worship you with our possessions, with the things that we have in this world, the things that you have blessed us with, with gratitude, with thankfulness, with generosity, and by being good stewards of what you have given to us to take care of. In Jesus' name, amen.